Hello, this is Rob Clark from the Chrome OS graphics team. I'm here to uh, give you a bit of an update on uh, what, we've been, <coughs> what we've been up to with Chrome OS and Virgino, including what we've been working on, the current status, uh, journey so far, a little bit about our CI setup, uh, demo, and some other useful information. So, probably shouldn't come as too much of a surprise if you follow uh, Mesa and kernel development, but we've been working on uh, Snapdragon Chromebooks, uh, the first two reference designs being uh, Trogdor and Strongbad. Uh, Trog Trogdor for clamshell and Strongbad for detachable. And as far as I know, they're the first consumer electronic Snapdragon devices to ship with upstream kernel support. And not just that, but upstream kernel support that's in place before they even shipped. Uh, and why might you ask, do we care about upstream kernel support? Well, on the Chrome OS side of things, we need to uh, support devices for a relatively long uh, uh, lifespan, which means we need to be able to do kernel updates to new kernel versions. We need to be able to do security and bug fixes. And uh, that's not really something you can do with the, the Android vendor kernel approach of millions of lines of code of, down, of downstream patches. Um, and what's more, it's as far as I know, the first consumer electronics ARM devices to ship with open source graphics drivers, all in upstream Mesa uh, before they shipped. Uh, and why might you ask, would we want open source graphics? Well, really, largely the same reasons as above. But also we need to be able to uh, implement extensions and features that are important for our use cases. Uh, one recent example is the EGL KHR mutable render buffer extension, which is uh, important for uh, low latency ink. Um, despite the awkward name, what that lets you have is uh, front buffer rendering essentially, which is important for low latency stylus. Uh, to reduce the latency between the pen position and pixels on the screen. Um, and also, uh, with an open source driver, this gives us good synergies with Intel and AMD. Uh, if you take the example of the mutable render buffer extension, that's all in uh, shared code that's also used by Radeon SI and, and Iris. Um, and there's other benefits. I mean, we found in fixed bugs that would have hit Intel or AMD when they move to a newer Mesa. Uh, there's lots of uh, common and shared code, uh, NUR, threaded context, and, and so forth. And, you know, of course, it's also the right thing to do. So what's the current status? Uh, currently, we're at, uh, on the Gallium side, at Glass 3.2. Uh, we've been passing all of DQB, Glass, and EGL uh, since maybe around August of last year um, because, of course, that's a, a required part of Android CTS that we need to be passing in order to ship. Um, on the Vulkan side, Turnip is at Vulkan 1.1. We've got maybe approximately 15 remaining CTS failures to fix up and we're also about seven extensions away from a 1.2. Um, we're supporting, in addition to the older generations of Adreno 200 through 500, we're supporting all four uh, sub-generations of Adreno 600, uh, where Gen 1 is uh, 618, 615, 630, Gen 2 is 640 and 680, Gen 3 is 650, and the most recent uh, Gen 4 is Adreno 660 and the 7C3. Um, and also, as of a few weeks ago, we're passing all of DQP Glass on 7C3. Um, we also have lots of nice uh, developer tools to, uh, um, like ISA spec, which is an XML based uh, shader instruction set description that we use to generate the code for encoding and decoding shaders. Um, we have a crash deck for decoding uh, GPU core dumps, uh, which, in ca which capture the entire command stream of a faulting submit, uh, GPU register snapshots, um, 
SQE, which is a CP processor. Uh, we capture its registers and program counters uh, and which packet it's parsing and so on. Um, and uh, recently, in last year, I sp uh, we have uh, Perfetto support for giving uh, a better picture of overall system performance. So in the, in the beginning, um, I started at Google and working full-time on Fruginio in April of 2019. You know, if you can remember back to pre-COVID days, um, Anhold started about a month later. Um, and uh, between us, we've been working on Fruginio. Anhold's also done a lot of stuff on just making Mesa better, like consolidating all the format enums uh, and working towards getting rid of GLSL to TGSI and so forth. Um, so in the first part, the, the, the focus was really uh, f finish all the big features and extensions and you know, start a little bit bringing down the, the, the CT, uh, DEQP failures. Um, and, you know, an important part of this was uh, getting uh, CI set up, which is covered a little bit more in later slides. Um, so in the early days, I think we went from maybe 90, 95% DEQP pass to just having a, a few remaining failures by the end of the year. Um, this is also the point where we start having a Play Store, which gives us a lot more interesting workloads and bugs to, to debug. Um, I mean, I'm a big, big fan of Super Tux Cart, but on ARM systems, there's not a lot of games available because you're generally limited to the open source games. And this was kind of the times before crazy people started doing, you know, emulation tricks for Steam Store on ARM. Um, this was about the point in time where we started working on medium P. We, we knew we'd really need FP16 support to hit our performance targets. So we worked with the Gallia on, on retrofitting uh, medium P support through GLSL and plumbing it through NUR. Um, it was about two years ago um, at XDC when a bunch of the NUR and other developers locked ourselves in a room and kind of hashed out a plan for, for moving forward on medium P. And then I think it was late October of that year that we um, brought up uh, Adreno 618. Um, this is interesting in a couple ways, partly because it's the GPU that's actually in the, the 7C Chromebooks that we're shipping today. Um, but it's also uh, the first time I think that, that I know of that we've uh, Done, uh, done. Wake up with Mesa on on a Snapdragon device. Uh, at this point, we would uh, already made the decision to go with uh, open source drivers, so there was no more blob driver available. So Qualcomm and hidden away in their labs when they're bringing up the first uh, samples needed something, some way to bring up uh, uh, the GPU, and they did that with Mesa. Um, so. Uh, and, you know, I work remotely with them on that. Um, so uh, about the very end of uh, 2019, beginning of 2020, is when we started getting uh, our first batch of Trogdor EVTs back. Uh, this is where the, the, the so-called real work begins. This is the thing that's going to be the reference design for the Chromebooks that are shipping these days, um, and uh, you know this is is uh, where it starts getting interesting. Uh, of course, uh, COVID soon soon makes the hardware schedule interesting with factory shutdowns and parts shortages and so travel restrictions and so on. But meanwhile, we keep kept pushing uh, on the the bug fixes and fixing game bugs and so on, and got to a. Uh, 100% DEQP and SKIA, SQ, SKQP pass. 
And so the focus shifts more towards performance. Uh, we landed uh, medium P support, um, you know, shader compiler improvements that brought little gains, you know, five, ten percent here, there, sorts of things. Um, uh, we figured out how to drive uh, LRZ properly, and in particular, the hard hardware has a nifty early LRZ, late Z mode. So LRZ is like kind of like a four free Z pre, uh, subsampled Z prepass that you get during the binning pass. Um, early LRZ late Z mode lets you do early Z tests in cases where a later draw occludes the fragments from an earlier draw. Um, but in a normal case, you wouldn't be able to disable early Z because say there's a discard in the fragment shader. Um, is worked on on plumbing uh, UBWC uh, uh, bandwidth compressed buffers uh, formats through Android, which is also used now on uh, Intel and AMD Chromebooks, uh, getting shader disk cache up and running for quicker game startup time and, and so forth. And I'd say overall, uh, we, you know, in terms of like benchmarks, we roughly nearly double the, the uh, performance in the uh, between late 2019 and mid 2020. Um, then the focus starts shifting more towards system performance um, and you know it does no good if, if you have the best benchmarks but if you have system level issues you know CPU freak, GPU freak governor, uh, task prioritization so on then, uh, then you're not going to have a nice user experience. Um, so early on, kind of counterintuitively, we had the, the most problems with uh, more lightweight games. You know, think something like Alto's Adventure, which is not really pushing the limits in any, any way um, as far as performance. But they would just not generate enough CPU load to push onto the big cores or to ramp uh, CPU freak up enough. And then they'd some other thing would happen in the system and in the background and they'd get preempted and you'd you know miss have a frame rate stutter and and you know that's not very nice um we also i also found some issues with prioritization in, in particular on the android side of things uh, surface flinger and everything that's involved in the path from the application to the screen runs as real-time priority which means it's running at a higher priority than the work queues on the kernel side that the atomic helpers use to push uh, async, you know, non-blocking uh, atomic updates to the driver, which is not great. You really want that to have a higher priority than surface flinger starting on the next frame. Um, so some of that has been partially solved and not the core DRM parts, but on the DRM MSM side of things, I've converted all the work queue usage to a K thread worker with real time priorities. Um, we still need to sort out something better for, for things like the atomic helpers. And that, that's really a, a cross driver driver issue. And that, that brings us up to the beginning of, of this year when the, uh, the first uh, Trogdor base, uh, base device, we call it Lazor. Um, in the outside world, it's known as the Acer Spin 513 shipped. Um, unfortunately, very initially, we started getting uh, reports of, of performance hiccups, in particular on the, the lower spec four gigabyte devices. and. Uh, so I had a bit of a, a crash course on, on ZRAM swap and, uh, and Chrome OS's approach to make uh, Chrome work on such a low memory device. Um, it turns out the low memory devices, you know, once you have a whole bunch of windows and tabs open, they're under constant, uh, constant memory pressure. Uh, so uh, if you get a, if you, are, if your kernel driver has a, a shrinker, you need to really make sure that uh, that it's as lockless as possible. And in particular, count objects needs to be lockless and you want to reduce the uh, critical section in, in scan objects. 
um, because otherwise you can get the be having the shrinker called on all all the uh, CPU cores at once, and that just serializes everything in the whole system, uh, which isn't great. Um, so I'll, I'll take part of the blame for that because I'd mostly tested on eight gigabyte devices because those were also the devices with larger uh, uh, disk sizes, and uh, you know that's kind of useful when you're testing a lot of Android games to not have to be constantly uninstalling and reinstalling. But uh, I think next time I'll remember to do some testing with mem equals 4G on the uh, on the kernel command line. <laughs> um, and we've also we also are working on uh, Profeto support to to improve our system level visibility, like what's going on on the CPU cores in correlation to what's going on on the GPU, and and where are where are the system level bottlenecks. So here's you know a screenshot can't really do it justice. You really have to have to play with the UI. But here's here's a Profeto trace. Uh, I'm just using an Android GPU inspector as as the UI for viewing the trace, but you can really drill down into uh, very small time windows. Um, if you see uh, uh, on the G, you know, above the GPU uh, timeline, you see all the, all the CPU timelines, what frequency and what tasks are running. Uh, on the GPU timeline, you can click on, you know, that surface uh, uh, bar there and uh, see information about uh, the render target, you know, how many MRTs, what the format is, dimensions, so on. Uh, below that you get a broken down view of the binning pass and per tile, uh, clear or restore, um, plus draw, plus resolve. Um, and if you go below, if you look below that, there's a little yellow lines. If you highlight one of those, that will that shows you where on the CPU the, the command stream submission happened. And if you highlight one of those, that will draw an arrow to the, the point where it started executing on the GPU. And then of course below that, uh, you can see uh, uh, GPU frequency and utilization and other performance counters. <clears throat> So we continued working on uh, various CPU bottlenecks that were showing up in, in places. Uh, threaded context was a big help in, in certain driver overhead situations. Uh, of course, uh, graphics bench uh, driver overhead off screen is a, is a notable one. Um, we uh, multi-threaded our, our shader compiler and made it uh, asynchronous so that we don't actually have to block until you do it, uh, need to emit a draw with that shader. Um, in, partic in particular, I was finding uh, Asphalt 9 with their, uh, which has a in-house game engine. It was generating new shaders mid-level uh, quite a bit, which is leading to compile a new shader janks, uh, which isn't great. Uh, the <clears throat> combination of the async shader compile and threaded context at least help mitigate that a bit by uh, uh, hiding a bit of the latency. Um, another another big one was uh, user space fences and submit merging, which cut down on our number of kernel IOPs quite a bit um, and helped in some cases where we're just uh, you know, the CPU is bottlenecking the GPU too much for the GPU to ramp up to higher frequencies. <clears throat> On the kernel side, there's some recent uh, Jeff, uh, GPU Dev Freak rework to, uh, uh, to, to improve some pedantic situations, which I'll go into a little bit more on the next uh, uh, slide, and then uh, DRM scheduler conversion. Um, which helps move blocking waiting on fences. Like say you're waiting for the previous uh, atomic update to uh, to finish. Um, it moves that out of the, the user space ioctal path. Um, there were also some cases which uh, uh, kind of annoyingly uh, we ended up having to resort to some GL vendor GL renderer shenanigans. Um, there are a few games that were trying to put uh, uh, 
trying to figure out what GPU they're running on and using different tiers of, of graphics settings. And when they saw Mesa, they didn't understand what it was, so they put it put us in the lowest tier, kind of artificially restricting graphic settings and artificially limiting frame rate, which was uh, not so great. Um, so I ended up implementing a way to uh, do per device uh, GL render overrides with DRI-conf uh, so that we can trick those games into actually running as fast as they should be. Oh yeah, and somewhere along the way we finished that last extension for uh, Glass 3.2 um, and figured out all of the uh, uh, corner cases where we needed to deal with UBWC or tile demotion. Um, So I mentioned about D GPU Dev Freak. Uh, what I was finding, um, if you look, the, the bottom line here is showing you the GPU frequency and the top line, or the above that, you can see where the GPU is actually active. And you can see that we're spending time here at higher frequencies while we're not doing anything. And then spending a lot of time at lower frequencies while we are trying to get work done. And you know, then we repeat the process. Um, so we came up with a uh, uh, combination of a longer sampling period to, uh, well, th this, this problem was especially bad on some of the games that were limiting themselves to 30 FPS because um, the previous uh, sampling period for Dev Freak was, I think, 10 milliseconds, which was just too short. And the constant one frame busy, one frame idle was really uh, confusing things. So you, you'd, it was even worse in this screenshot here. Um, um, you'd see it at a minimum frequency until almost the end of the, the rendering, and then it would pop up to maximum frequency and then stay there for most of a, uh, a frame doing nothing. Um, so the what I ended up doing was going with a longer sampling period to average things out over a, a few frames um, and then uh, clamping the frequency to the minimum when uh, when we're idle so we're not sitting there spinning away at a high frequency doing nothing and then to, to mitigate a little bit the um, fact that the longer sampling period would take us longer I mean, we'd take longer to react on interactive workloads, you know, think like scrolling a web page or something like after you've been reading for a couple minutes. Um, there's a, a bit of a, a boost if the GPU has been idle for a while and it becomes active. We uh, give a little bit of an extra boost to the frequency um, initially. <clears throat> so... Um, a little bit about our, our CI farm. On the, the right here, you can see a, uh, a picture of our little uh, CI farm rack. Uh, the boards are actually kind of hard to spot. You can see some on the uh, second shelf uh, down from from the top and some, some below it. The boards actually don't take up very much space. We just uh, stack the bare boards on top of each other with standoffs. Um, a lot more of the space goes to the uh, uh, power supply, the USB relays, the network switch, and so on. Um, so in the current state, we have uh, about 25 runners total in, in the CI farm, uh, nine Adreno 630, although there's a couple, couple that are offline at the moment, uh, eight uh, with Adreno 530, uh, and eight with Adreno uh, 307. Um, this gives us enough to uh, do uh, pre-merged uh, pre CI with 100% of DQP uh, EGL and GLASS coverage on, on the Adreno 600 devices. Uh, also a 10% uh, coverage run with the address sanitizer, 33% uh, of a Vulcan run uh, in addition to uh, several several traces uh, tests, um, we don't do it 
pre-merge, but we do nightly now thanks to uh, to Collabora uh, performance traces, so we can track over time uh, performance and see if something has come in that has regressed uh, performance. Uh, and then uh, on Adreno uh, 530, we've got uh, a little bit less coverage, uh, mostly because there's some, at the moment, some CPU freak uh, issues, I believe, that are kind of limiting how much we can run. Uh, and then the 306 has 100% coverage of of all the GL it can do, it, it, it's not quite enough to do Gloss 3.1. Um, and uh, on a weekday, uh, the CI farm's running between 500 and 1,000 jobs a day. Um, it's uh, much less busy on the weekends if, if you're uh, looking for some CI time to test things. <laughs> And uh, because of all this, we've been able to keep the uh, tip of tree mesa green, and we've actually been shipping tip of tree mesa in Chrome OS uh, because of that. Um, basically, when we uh, uh, when we come time to uprev uh, Chrome OS for uh, for Juno uh, branch, we do a git fetch uh, upstream main, git merge upstream main and some testing. Um, this, we do this roughly every four to six weeks and it's worked surprisingly well. Um, initially I expected that once we started shipping devices we would switch, switch to Mesa release branches but this has actually worked well so we just kind of stuck with it. Um, we haven't had too many regressions on uprevs uh, very early on. We had to couple times we hit YEV regressions, uh, but we now have coverage of those code paths in CI. Um, we, I think the only thing we hit from time to time these days are uh, our uh, SCIA SQ, SKQP uh, regressions because we don't have any coverage of that in, in CI, and SCIA is basically a GL fuzzer. Um, a few of those times are actually skia bugs, so um, but you know, still catching them earlier would mean less time uh, uh, debugging later. And demo. Well, actually, this is kind of the demo. Uh, I, of course, wrote the slides on a, a 7C Chromebook um, running Chrome OS. And the presentation I recorded in Ob Studio, uh, running on a 7C Chromebook, running Fedora and uh, upstream kernel. So yeah, uh, this is your demo. <laughs> so if you're curious, um, and I, I suppose everyone knows where to find uh, upstream kernel and Mesa trees, so I didn't bother listing those. But this is what we're shipping in in Chrome OS. Um, the Chrome OS for Juno branch on Mesa is most of the time just tip of tree Mesa whenever we did the last uprev. Occasionally we cherry pick a few fixes. Um, you know, whenever we do a, a merge from upstream update, the only delta is the addition of an owner's file. You know, we don't have any downstream uh, patches. Um, on the kernel side, the devices that are shipping right now are running a, a 5.4 based kernel with a lot of stuff from newer upstream backported. Um, you know, most, most of the patches are either cherry picked from upstream or from a next branch, you know, from git and sometimes picked from list. Um, on the DRAM MSM side, the one notable exception is we have a uh, hack patch to tie uh, KMS planes to a single CRTC to to work around some user space issues. And for the uh, detachable tablet devices, there's a pile of downstream MIPI uh, camera uh, patches, unfortunately. And then there's also some patches that are needed for, uh, for the Android uh, container to work. Uh, you know, Android has some dependencies on some some downstream patches. Um, other than uh, Android apps, if you are uh, in dev mode on one of these Chromebooks, you can just build an upstream kernel and put it on it and expect things to work. Um, 
So other useful things if you're interested in uh, playing around with things like upstream kernel and Mesa and on Chromebooks. Uh, there's this uh, thing called Suzy Q. It's this kind of orange looking, looks like a normal USB cable, but isn't. Um, it, what it is is actually a, a, a serial to, you know, it gives you a TTY USB port for the uh, kernel uh, serial debug port and also for the EC and CR50. Um, so this is something I wish that uh, Windows laptops had as well. Um, it makes it a much more, uh, less aggravating experience when you're making kernel changes and things don't boot. You know, you can at least get a debug UART port and see what happened uh, versus just guessing. Um, other things I'd recommend to have uh, would be a, a USB-C hub with Ethernet and power pass through. Um, on all of all of these Chromebooks, you have two USB-C ports. You know, if you're using one for the uh, uh, for Suzy Q, then you have one other uh, remaining. Um, USB thumb drive is useful to have. Um, if, you, if you have a good image on a USB C thumb drive, you can always recover. Um, you know, it's pretty much impossible to brick. Uh, and then I put here a link to uh, Jesse Barnes has a cross util uh, tree on GitLab, which has scripts that make it really easy to, to put a kernel on, on one of these devices. And then uh, we also have some docs in Mesa about uh, replacing the Android drivers, uh, you know, in Chrome OS. So uh, thank you. And uh, hopefully by now I've managed to join the uh, the streaming thing to, to answer answer questions. Ryan Hudek asks, how soon until UBWC 3D texture support? So I start getting a warning about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. I guess we do have to go back and finish that. Uh, I'd forgotten about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it looks like the talk was pretty exhaustive. So there are no more questions for today. Uh, thank you and your magnificent bureau for the great talk. <laughs> thank All you. Right, I'm going to get some coffee. <laughs> have a good morning and have a great conference. <laughs>